morning, everybody. I welcome you all. I'm so delighted to see such a wonderful array of brains and brilliance in one room and under the big elephant of the Harvard Club. So let me begin by first, um, Dr. Paula Rosen, I'm the publisher of Education Update. This is our 15th annual event honoring Outstanding Educators of the Year. <laughs> We live in an age of violence. Every day, newspapers and the media discuss the violence of man against man. The only way to diffuse and change that rubric is through education. We're here to celebrate the accomplishments of seven distinguished leaders being honored today, as well as 23 teachers and principals and two young journalists. <clears throat> the distinguished leaders that we honor today, Linda McCauley, David Levin, Felix Matos Rodriguez, Blake Spahn, Mr. G, and Linda Ciro. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Everyone in this room has helped students, teachers, and principals learn and helped them achieve new goals. You have inspired them to go down new paths. You are an incredible group of people and deserve the medals and accolades that are bestowed on you today. Teaching is vital. President Obama, in a recent issue of our newspaper, spoke about the power of his fifth grade teacher, who made him and every student in the class feel special. Dr. John King, who we interviewed, the former US Secretary of Education, said the teachers he had at PS 276 in Canarsie and Mark Twain Junior High School in Brooklyn are the reason that he is doing this job. Mark Twain once said, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Kindness, knowledge, and inspiration should be the mantra by which we teach. I want to thank my brilliant advisory council, comprised of illustrious deans and college president emeriti, for their insight and advice. I want to thank our sponsors for their generosity, <clears throat> and I want to thank my exceptional staff for all they do. I now want to pass the baton of leadership to President Jennifer Rabb of Hunter College, who will be introducing distinguished leader Linda McCauley, followed by distinguished leader David Levin. Thank you, Paula. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you, all of you, this morning, and it is my honor to introduce the first two award winners. How do we transform the American educational system to make it more effective? And how do we capitalize on the power of technology to drive this transformation? And perhaps most important of all, how do we use that technology to help the teachers who are on the front lines of this challenge to raise their game? These are the questions that our first award winner, David Levin, is dedicated to answering. And thanks to his visionary leadership as its president and CEO, McGraw-Hill Education is on the cutting edge of innovation and transformation. David was one of the first to not only recognize that education has to change dramatically to respond to the modern world, but to apply his resources to the problem to affect real transformation. As David puts it, that change from job for life to multiple jobs and multiple skills means that how you learn is very important. It is David's mission to use technology positively to transform the educational experience for educators and students alike. Because of David, McGraw-Hill has pioneered some of the most advanced adaptive software for the classroom. This technology provides students and teachers with constant feedback so that each can see how the learning process is progressing or standing still. 
In a remarkable comment, David got to the heart of the issue. He said, it is technology designed to let students fail without penalty. In fact, it is a way to make failure a part of the learning process. If you train educators this way, they can employ technology to enhance individualized education practices. When a teacher asks her questions, her students can immediately respond with the push of a button, and the teacher can get a real-time breakdown of student understanding. It's like an instant evaluation. Students have the security to participate more, and teachers can follow up with students who are struggling privately or identify classroom leaders. And this software can also be a way for teachers to discover the brilliant lecture he or she just delivered actually went right over the heads of most of the kids in the class. It is software that educates our educators. So David, it is very clear from your work that technology is one of the brilliant keys we have now to improve education. You have moved the needle and set the pace for all of us. And it remains for us now to employ your vision in our classrooms. It is therefore most appropriate that you are honored here today as an outstanding educator of the year. As a college president, I am grateful for your groundbreaking work in integrating technology into education and pushing the frontiers of learning forward. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating David Levin. Well, thank you very much. Um, may, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you, and it's a tremendous honor, and, and what an extraordinary event, celebrating actually you, not, not me. Um, and I feel very flattered and honored to be here. I, I'm actually going to depart from the things that I was going to say that I'd prepared, because this time yesterday, I was on um, 19th Street um, and was watching uh, 100 firefighters battling a blaze in my apartment. And one of the things that I took away from seeing them there, and very fortunately nobody was hurt, was the incredible focus and leadership of a group of individuals in addressing a problem. They didn't know what it was. They went forward. They adapted to it. They dealt with the problems around them with tremendous bravery and dedication. And civic leadership and the values of being able to say, I've got something to do which is important beyond myself, really shone out. So I, I personally feel that I got a lesson yesterday in civic leadership and one of the core skills that isn't about software, that isn't about anything else, but that is fundamental to the education system, which is to bring forward a generation of people who are willing, when they see that fire, to walk into it. And I saw that yesterday. So please join me in, in, uh, in, a, in a brief round of applause for what I saw yesterday to the FDM world. We can all talk about software, and I think sometimes technology gets in the way. Great teachers have always known what was going on with their individual pupils. The, the challenge is that it's very hard to do that when you don't have the time or the focus or the group is too big or the, diverse, the, the sheer diversity of ability and preparation make it challenging to spot what's going on with an individual student. So we took about as our mission the purpose of reconnecting McGraw-Hill with its soul, and its soul is very much to be a part of that educational ecosystem, helping unlock the potential of every learner, but understanding that we do that in working in partnership with educators. And the intent was to create, out of using software, information and ways that faculty in higher education, teachers in in schools, superintendents and administrators across the system could spot things going wrong. And it is wonderful now, as we begin to see great case, great case studies coming back, of how great educators are adopting and adapting and using and harnessing data to allow them to engage with those individuals that need it fastest and most. And what we're finding most interesting is this is happening at all levels of preparation. So well-prepared students are able to soar faster, and we're working at Georgia Tech to make that happen with the best prepared, but also terribly underprepared students who otherwise can fail so fast can be caught and supported 
in a system which identifies what they don't have, what they don't know, allowing a great teacher to intervene and say, let me get you on this pathway. I'm not going to penalize you for failure. I'm going to encourage your failure because that allows me to see what you don't know. And once I know what you don't know, then we can start making progress. So my deepest thanks to Pola, my enormous gratitude for this award. Thank you very much, and I'm really touched to be here with you. And I hope that we as a company can focus ourselves in service of educators in our next incarnation as we go forward. Thank you. Linda Macaulay, the next award should be called When Good Things Happen to Really Good People. In my allotted few minutes, I will make a valiant attempt to summarize Linda McCauley's contributions to education. But I must start out by underscoring Linda McCauley's wonderful personal qualities, her graciousness, her integrity, her insightfulness, and her warmth. As the president of the college with the largest and most popular Macaulay program, and on behalf of our current Dean Mary Pearl and our former Dean Ann Kirshner, and to all of us in this room, the Macaulay Pro Pro Honors Program at CUNY, we all know, has become synonymous with excellence, ambition, and achievement. With her formidable husband, Bill, Linda has taken, where Bill has taken a more public role, anyone who knows that this loving couple will agree that their work and their life is a true partnership in all that they do. Linda has been a critical advisor in the growth of one of the most successful experiments in honors education and a signature example of how excellence and access can triumph together in public higher education. The hundreds of Macaulay success stories already taking leadership positions in our city, their success fueled by their debt-free honors education, and the hundreds still in our CUNY classrooms, many immigrants and first-generation college students, are a testament to Linda and Bill's life-changing vision. Let's now focus on Linda's extraordinary contributions as a scientist and a science educator. Here in our urban environment, it is more common for us to hear a subway rattle or a car horn than a bird song. Linda's marvelous work bridges the gap between the classroom and the natural world. Linda is a valued trustee of Cornell University where there is a science lab that bears her name. And she's the vice chairman of the great science and educational institution, the American Museum of Natural History. And very recently, Linda received a well-deserved appointment to the board of the prestigious Rockefeller University. But all of her contributions in science leadership and education, I want to highlight Linda's role as one of the world's leading recorders of bird song. Linda has carried her recording equipment across six continents and throughout more than 50 countries. She has captured the sounds of thousands of birds, including such exotic species as the cave-dwelling rockfowl of Gabon and white-head trogons in Malaysia. In the process, she's had to stare down all sorts of dangers, including lions, hippos, and even on one occasion, some armed rebels in West Africa. But none of it has ever dampened Linda's spirit and her dedication. Her recordings are now part of the largest collection of the kind in the world, the Ornithology Lab of Cornell's Macaulay Library. It is all online, so if any of you ever want to hear a bird call or identify something you hear in your garden, you should go pull up the Macaulay Library and check it out. Like our groundbreaking scientist Ed Hunter, who used the sounds of songbirds to study mechanism of vocal learning, Linda uses her recordings to a bird and animal sounds to document their behavior and their geographic variation. Linda has said that to lear learning to recognize bird sounds is one of the most difficult challenge she has faced in her life work. As Linda puts it, you automatically know the sound of voices of your family, your friends, and people you work with. You usually don't stop and think, who am I talking to? But this is precisely what a birder do, does. The bird sound library Linda has built through her own hands-on exploration and by learning this very precise science will push forward the frontiers of neuroscience and animal behavior research. Pola, I am so grateful that you chose to recognize Linda's contributions as a scientist and a science educator because in society we just don't do enough to recognize the role of women as science leaders. Recently there was a commercial done by GE 
that was shown in the Tonys and the Oscars that asked the question, what if women scientists were treated like Kim Kardashian? And there was a picture of women scientists being chased by paparazzi and having Barbie dolls made of them. So Linda, today we move this uh, frontier forward by recognizing all that Linda McCauley has done in the world of science and the world of science education. You are truly a trailblazer and it's a pleasure to present this, present this Distinguished Educator Award to you. Good morning. Wow, this is really an honor. It's great to be here this morning. You know, in the United States, we have tremendous opportunity. I've traveled to 135 countries in the world, and boy, when you come home, it's a great place to be. Uh, while we hear a lot about how education is failing so many students, we don't hear enough about all of the successes that our educational system is having. And there's some terrific success stories. The Macaulay Honors College obviously is one of them. Uh, New York City's public schools producing amazing scholars in every field. Many are immigrants, they come from 60 countries, many are the first in their families to go to college, and most of them are going to stay right here in New York and be our leaders and run this city. They train in all fields, 10% every year go to medical school, uh, and many go to the best graduate programs in the world. Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge. And in the past 10 years, they've won all the top undergraduate prizes. Two Rhodes Scholars, 28 National Science Foundation Awards, 13 Goldwaters, seven Trumans, 37 Fulbrights, and more. I'd like to also mention the American Museum of Natural History, which reaches, well, 500,000 students every year visit the museum and their middle school science initiative program uh, is to teach the understanding of science inquiry and it's in 46 percent of the middle schools in new york and it reaches 85,000 students a year the museum also grants master's degrees in teaching uh, science for educators and all of the students i think almost all of them in our program in the last five years teach in underperforming New York City schools, which is pretty amazing. And I'd like to finish up with Rockefeller University, founded to study disease and translate what the scientists find into things that will save our lives. Their faculty has had 24 Nobel laureates on it, 22 Albert Lasker awardees, and 20 National, Sci National Medal Science winners. And I'd like to tell you about one of their scientists. Eric Jarvis grew up in the Bronx, went to New York City public schools, uh, went to Hunter High School, graduated from Hunter College with a degree in math and biology, and went on to uh, Rockefeller to get a PhD, and then went to Duke uh, to teach. He was awarded a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator Award in 2008 which is one of the highest awards you can get in science. And luckily for New York and Rockefeller, he has just returned to Rockefeller to have his own lab and be on the faculty there. So here's another person who came out of the New York City public school systems who's really making a difference. Um, I can tell you a great education is available and it's available here today. Our students are going to be the leaders and thinkers saving lives, transforming lives, and I've really been lucky to have been able to help influence and improve the opportunities that are available. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing um, what happens in education in the next 10 years. I'd like to now introduce Chancellor of the New York State Board of Regents, Betty Rosa, who will be introducing President Felix Matos Rodriguez of Queens College. Betty, es un placer. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Buenos dias. Uh, let me just start by saying thank you for the shout out for the Bronx. Um, having been a Bronx girl, 
it's, uh, it's, a, it's amazing when we hear these incredible stories about uh, individuals who have these incredible opportunities, but also who return and come home to give back. So this morning, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce Felix Vincente, I have to get this right, Marcos Rodriguez, known as Velo. <laughs> Today, I just want to talk a little bit about this incredible, noted Puerto Rican scholar that makes us all proud of the work that he has done. He's one of the few educators in the U.S. who has served both as president of a community college in the Bronx, Ostos Community College, and he is currently finishing his third year at Queens College. This apparently gives him a unique and compelling perspective on the issues facing higher education. As a leader of over 20,000 students, serving over 170 countries, he brings an incredible combination of excellence, scholarship, teaching, administration, at the senior level, and he does this with such elegance. Um, a cum laude graduate in Latin American Studies from Yale University, President Matos received his PhD in history from Columbia University. He's taught at Yale, uh, Northeastern University, Boston College, and other places where he has left his mark and his imprint. Also, he has served as director of the Center of Puerto Rican, of Puerto Rican stu uh, Students and a former cabinet secretary of the Department of Family Services for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Queens College continues to lead all other colleges in New York City in educating and preparing more teachers, counselors, administrators for New York City public schools. A new, a new first of its kind master's program starting this fall will train mathematics teachers to teach computer science in the public school. Queens College today enrolls the third largest number of business, economic, and accounting majors of any New York State college. A new master's degree in geotechnology utilizing high-tech laboratories and a cadre of prominent faculty involved in local community and international research are creating new opportunities for the students in Queens College. He initiated a new program this past academic year. Um, it's called Queens College in Four. Um, I know it wasn't I know it wasn't QBC, but Queens College in Four to help students complete the, their a uh, bachelor's degree in four years. Queens College now ranks in the top 1% of the 2,200 colleges nationwide in moving students up the economic ladder according to a highly respected study reported in the New York Times and led by Stanford University economist. I have to tell you that it is an, an amazing pleasure to stand here and present to you not only Fedo, but someone that I have such high regards for, as I would call in my family, mi hermano. Uh, and so without further ado, I, I introduce to you Dr. Felix Vincente Matos Rodriguez. Hi. Uh, so let's hear it for uh, Betty Rosa, our educator. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Muchísimas gracias. You know that your friendship and your support means the world to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you also to uh, Paula Rosen from Education Update. We can give Paula another big round of applause for not just the, the importance that your publication uh, provides, but also for building an incredible sense of community, which is so important in the educational endeavor. You can feel even in this dark room with all these serious looking folks' portraits looking at us, I think the warmth and the energy of those of us who work in education and what Paula does 
uh, supersede some of that, um, some of that counter, counter energy. It is quite an honor to be named an Outstanding Educator of the Year in this distinguished company, uh, including our uh, author and reporter, uh, Cheryl Wills, who is so frequently, yes, we can give Cheryl a big round of applause, who is often visiting our campus, and, um, and she's also part of the family, and is married to a Queens College alum, so uh, music, music to my ears. Uh, it is also very uh, special to be recognized in the same program, uh, along with uh, Linda McCauley and her husband Bill, uh, the benefactors of the McCauley Honors College. Uh, I also want to acknowledge educators we work in, in, in with a sense of community, so I want to acknowledge some members uh, who make the work that I do uh, easier and possible. First, um, the our, uh, local assemblywoman from Manhattan, uh, Rebecca Searwise, who's in the audience, so I recognize Rebecca. Our Vice President for uh, Communication and Marketing and a Senior Advisor to the President, Jay Hershenson, who's here today. Uh, someone who's known to many of you here, the Dean of our Education School, Craig Michaels, who's over there, Craig. And the educator in chief in my family, my wife Liliana. Uh, since we have a large number of educators in the audience, I just want to point out that the Michaels is available at the end to talk about this new program that we developed at Queens College, the first of a kind, uh, getting teachers who are already certified. Uh, to be able to teach computer science in our high school. We're responding to the challenge. We're talking about the need to do technology in our schools. We need the best teachers to do that. So we're responding to the challenge by creating this new program, which will be beginning in the fall. So if anybody's interested, the Michaels is the person to ask. And we're merging the, uh, the leadership and the expertise at Queens College in being a longstanding training or teacher teachers and also having the largest number of computer science major of any school in New York City to advance uh, the state and the city's agenda and our partnership with the mayor in the computer science for all initiative. Um, educators are nada, nothing, if they don't travel along with the students that they work with. And uh, today I want to highlight a student that represents the very best of what Queens College represents and the very best of what the Macaulay Honors College represents. So I want to give a shout out to Joanna de Jesus. Joanna, you can stand up. Who, Joanna just graduated uh, three weeks ago from Queens College at Macaulay, getting her degree in Applied Linguistics and TESO. And uh, we're very proud of her. She's a winner of a number of fellowships a campus leader, she was an RA in our residence hall, keeping everybody straight and, and, um, and in shape. And uh, last two summers ago, she was one of eight students selected nationwide with a paid internship to go teach English to students in Vietnam. So, and, and there's more, she was accepted into the very competitive Institute for the Recruitment of Teachers program at Andover, so she'll be joining them this weekend, right? So let's give Joanna a big, big round of applause. And I mentioned Joanna not just because I love her and she represents the best of what Queens College brings, but she's an exceptional student, but uh, not the exception in places like Queens and uh, Macaulay. Many of our students are extremely talented. They come from challenging economic backgrounds and many are the first in their families to earn a college degree. And with that college degree, many of them move to economic prosperity and achievement as documented in that study that uh, Chancellor Rosa mentioned by Stanford University in which Queens College was highlighted in among, among the 1% of all colleges in the country, moving students in the bottom 10% of uh, the socioeconomic scale to the top 10%. And, um, and when you are an educator, that is your dream, that the impact of the work that you do is able to transform people's lives, students' lives, and in this case, uh, have students that come from modest backgrounds be able to achieve the American dream and break the cycle of intergenerational poverty. 
Let me conclude by saying that if I and all of today's honorees are considered outstanding educators and advocates, it is because that is what our students need us to be, and we wouldn't have it any other way. I thank you for this award. That is really a recognition of the transformative work that we do at Queens College day in and day out. Thank you very much. I want to give a shout out to a very dear friend, Joyce Callan, who is a great philanthropist and is here with us today and encourages education all around the country. So thank you, Joyce, for all the work that you do. And sitting at her table is none other than the, the principal of the Heritage School, which Joyce founded, and that's in Manhattan and New York City. Uh, Deanon Subram, would you like to stand, please? Cheryl Wills has been a newscaster since 1992. Her new program embraces such diverse topics as Lubis, what happens when military veterans come home, gun violence, homelessness, and the mentally ill. She has authored two children's books and continuing in her pursuit to bring education to the community. She's a graduate of the Newhouse School at Syracuse University, and she is also the author of Die Free, a heroic family tale which traces her great, great, great grandfather, that's three greats, right, Cheryl? <laughs> Sandy Wills' courageous service in the Civil War as a member of the U.S. Colored Troops. She's also the founding commander of the New York chapter of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Colored Troops. Cheryl, would you come up for me? Good morning, everyone. Paula Rosen, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You and your staff at Education Update, I appreciate this honor. I am very grateful. I'd like to salute all of my fellow honorees. I am humbled to be in the same category as you. And good morning to all of you. I have a deep and abiding respect for educators as I sleep with one every night. My husband, <laughs> my husband is a principal. And I would like to apologize for my early departure. I have to speak at a graduation in Brooklyn. Thank you. And I am speaking to people who are labeled at-risk youth. And I want you to know I'm very excited to meet these young men because I am going to tell them that they are truly at risk for success. They are at risk for greatness. I don't believe in the labels that so many people put on our precious students who can reach for the stars, save for the labels that sometimes drag them down. That will be my graduation message to them. Lastly, I would like to dedicate this beautiful award to my great, great, great grandfather, Sandy Wills. He was a man that lived on a plantation and he had no hope until President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. At that moment, he escaped and fought for his freedom in the Civil War. That story was lost to me when I was a student in New York City public schools and I deeply regret it. However, I make up for it by entering the schools by the hundreds and sharing the stories of empowerment, sharing stories with students who cannot see their way through the pain and the despair, sharing the story of empowerment and encouraging students to find their own stories and to find an appreciation. I'm so proud to tell you that PBS is coming with me back to the plantation where my ancestors lived in Tennessee next month.
They heard about all of my travels and schools from here to California, Chicago, to this deep south, and they are following me back to the plantation. It is just how my ancestors left it. They even still sell cotton. And we, PBS reached out and said a descendant of one of the slaves that is presumably buried in an unmarked plot on your plantation is coming. And they said she'll be trespassing if she steps on our land. I don't know about you, but I'm so happy that they're not welcoming me because I don't need a welcome mat. I am empowered and I'm ready to represent this great city of New York. I don't need their permission to go find my family. And that's the gift I give to every student in this city, empowerment. Thank you so much. It makes me realize, no matter what anybody says in Washington or any place else, we are a nation of immigrants. And we come from all different parts of the world. And we're represented here in this room now. I am so thrilled that everybody is here. So I'd like to now welcome Dr. Charlotte Frank, who will be introducing and giving an award to Mr. G. And if you don't know who Mr. G is, look up at the sky, look at the weather, and you'll find out who Mr. G is. I always say, I do not need a microphone. You cannot be a teacher. But all right, I'll use the microphone because my boss would like me to use it. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce a guy, a guy who was born Irv Gakowski, but is now known as Mr. G. The most popular TV weatherman, Mr. G, began his career as a school teacher at Albert Einstein Intermediate School in the Bronx. I taught there before he ever went there, before I think even before he was born. I mean, that's our, that's our history together. Mr. G went from being a school, school teacher, he continued to become a TV weatherman in New York's WCBS TV channel to New York in 1979. I just want to say, how many folks here are still in school? Put your hands up. You never know what you're going to do. Just know, you start here, you start there, but then you start to dream, and you get an opportunity, grab the opportunity, so that you can move ahead. And that's, that's what Mr. G did. All right, you know him, he is now forecasting or involved in charitable endeavors. Mr. G is a very special human being. There's a history that he brings and a future that he brings, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. G. Why the heck are you give me a weatherman award is beyond me. It's gonna rain on Saturday. It's gonna be nice on Sunday. If I'm wrong, call the chancellor. What am I getting? I love her. And she doesn't even know this. Fifty years ago, shy three months, I walked into IS-131 in the Bronx. Long hair, tight shirt, not having a clue, just wanting to have fun. After I met Charlotte Frank, who gave me that frank look, I said to myself, this is going to be a serious endeavor. She doesn't know this, but uh, she was one of the people very early on who got me to understand that I was in a Title I school with kids who really had needs, deep-seated needs. What I didn't know at the time was I grew up as one of these kids. So after the first year, I'll snitch on myself. Thank you for bearing with this. But I decided that I want to teach these kids weather. My kids were in gangs. My kids were distressed. And three days a week, 
I got up at 4.30 in the morning, I went to Cold Spring, and I watched this guy light up a room with teletypes and computers and kids who are middle class doing it. And I said to myself, my kids can do it. And I came back and I told the principal, Irv Camel, and he said, no way, can't do it, too hard. Back up I went, back up I went. I was so involved that I'd bring my students at 5.30 in the morning in my car to see what they could do. And then I brought them back. I wasn't interested in anything other than seeing if I could light the passion. And we did. For 10 years. And during those 10 years, in the seventh year, or eighth year of teaching, CBS came to watch me teach. After the lesson, a guy comes over to me, Ed Joyce, who was a news director, who later became the head of CBS, said one question. Can you do that in front of a camera? And I said, what? Whatever you just did to hold those kids in the Bronx for 45 minutes, can you do it in front of the camera? So I had said yes. I had no idea what I was doing. And he said, good, you're hired. I said, to do what? And he's looking at me like, he just made a mistake. <laughs> I said, no. He said, you're going to be our weekend weatherman. When he left, there was a little girl called Christy Nichols who named him Mr. G. And she goes like this. All men in the audience know what this means when a woman does this. She was 12 years old. And she said, Mr. G, we not only gave you the name, we gave you the job. <laughs> and don't you ever forget it. <laughs> the end of the story is that as I look back over my life and seven decades into my life, I have the right to look back at it. I've come to certain conclusions. Number one, we're all angels, but we can't fly with one wing. We need people. And the kids we're talking about really need good, caring, loving, nurturing, sustaining adults in their lives. And as I look back, there were four people that I learned from. Number one is standing to my right, and she doesn't know it. Charlotte used to look at me, and I said, get serious to myself. She doesn't know when she was teaching math and I started the weather program. I think she doesn't know how important she was to me. Number two, Dr. Elliot Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro was a world-class Gestalt therapist. He became my best friend. He was a Jewish principal in Harlem that a best-selling book was written about because he cared. The book was called Our Children Are Dying. He taught me once, and he was always there for me. And I'll never forget this, and I want to share it with you. There's no other species on Earth that needs more nurturing than the human species. Birds are told to fly, they fly. That's true. Not true with our species. Between the ages of zero and seven years old, they will learn more than they will learn for the rest of their lives. And it's up to us to get in there very early to help save the day. The third person that comes into my life is Ted Sorensen. Ted Sorensen, for those of you who don't remember, was uh, President Kennedy's speechwriter. He's the guy. He's the guy who wrote "Ask Not What You Can Do for Your Country," and people say, "Did you really say that?" He said, "Ask Not." <laughs> He told me how important judgment was. He made it very clear to me. No judgment, no leadership. If you lack judgment, you cannot lead because people will not follow. And I know I'm right because Charlotte just said it's true. <laughs> 
And finally, my wife. Immigrant comes here with $200, doesn't speak the language, graduates with a master's degree, honored at Hunter College during graduation, and I learned as a man that if you're in the presence of a right woman and she sits you down, you better listen. <laughs> because she means business and you mean business. Thanks for inviting me. I'd like to now introduce Vice Chancellor Blake Spahn, who is uh, one of the uh, heads of one of the oldest private schools in New York City. Everybody wants to go there, Blake. So if I can raise my hand and get first on your list. Um, and he will be introduced by co-publisher uh, Adam Sugarman of Education Update. Dr. Blake Spahn and his colleagues strive to prepare students to be well-versed, to be integral parts of their societies. Working on campuses in New York, London, Shanghai, Seoul, Dubai, and on the internet all over the world, Vice Chancellor Dr. Spahn epitomizes excellence in leadership, determination, and grace. His own Dwight education prepared him well for his college experiences at Columbia University where he served as captain of its undefeated men's tennis championship team. He then earned master's and doctorate degrees in comparative international education from Oxford. At the Dwight School, which Dr. Rosen mentioned, was founded in 1872 and was the first school in the US to start a K-12 international baccalaureate program that Dr. Spahn has led efforts to expand into new markets abroad, develop programs to close the current gender gap in STEM careers, implement programs like the Spark Tank, which is an incubator that fosters entrepreneurship and leadership skills. All of these worthy efforts take place as the Dwight School expands in New York, the aforementioned cities around the world, and online. But it's through this prism of, of opening minds within unique cultural contexts that Dwight students continue to excel. We proudly present Dr. Blake Spahn with his well-deserved Educator of the Year Award from Education Update. Uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, with such uh, incredible educators. Um, I remember when I was doing my doctorate, we had a speaker come, Sir Edmund King. And he was the person that actually created my course of study, comparative international education. He was 93 years old. He bound into the room with incredible energy and gave this amazing talk on how Jap the Japanese education system compared to the British education system compared to the US education system. And everyone in my class ask these great questions. But I raised my hand uh, towards the end and I said, Professor King, you know, sorry, this has nothing to do with your lecture, but it's so rare to see someone in his 90s that seems so happy, so healthy. What's the secret to life? He paused, thought about it for a while, and he said, to be a foreigner, stop for a minute, and said, but I don't mean you have to go to other countries. That would be great if you have the opportunity. But what I mean is, you have to put yourself in uncomfortable positions where you're pushed to question your own values and your own way of thinking. And that's what makes me happy. Every single day, I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And really, the, the teachers at Dwight 
this, this award is really in their honor. And, and all of you here that push your students every day out of their comfort zone. Thank you very much. We have a wonderful, wonderful artist, Linda Ciro, who will be introduced for an award by Hunter Dean Michael Middleton. I want to start, we're here to recognize distinguished leaders across the city in education, but I want to stop for a minute and ask anybody in the room who's been a K-12 teacher to please raise your hand. A K-12 teacher. Who, I know we're accustomed in our country to recognizing people in various forms of public service. I want to stop for a moment and applaud all of you and thank you for your service. So thank you for inviting me to join you today to honor these distinguished leaders across the city. As you may know, Thomas Hunter, who founded Hunter College, believed in strong teacher preparation and also in access to education. I'm pleased that at Hunter we continue this tradition today and that together we can continue the tradition of recognizing excellence in educational leadership. Our commitment to building equity and excellence at Hunter um, across the city is evidenced by our new partnership under the leadership of President Rob with PS7 in East Harlem where we're working with their faculty and administrators to tra transform that school into a premier arts education elementary school. As we know, the, the fine arts play a crucial role in developing and educating young minds. It helps students discover new ways to make meaning, develop cultural perspectives, raise student self-confidence, and promote their social skills. Art education is quite simply an invaluable part of a rounded education by helping students be better and more creative learners. For nearly 20 years, Linda Soreau has been enriching, invigorating, and guiding students in creativity and art as an art teacher at the Dalton School. Linda is an accomplished visual artist in New York whose works have been exhibited in dozens of shows. She studied at the Boston Museum School and the Pratt Institute. Her abstract works employ a variety of materials and reflect her love of color, movement, and perhaps most interesting, in, interestingly, the process of painting. Her website, which showcases an impressive array of her works, also reflects how the creative process itself is significant. It's this kind of passion and focus on creativity that Linda applies to her, her art that she also applies to her teaching. The work that Linda has done with her students every day over the years in the classroom has inspired students who are in a position to be future leaders in society. She's used art to enrich the ways in which these young people learn, has stretched their minds, and has helped them make connections with each other and with their own inner creative selves. I'm honored to recognize Linda Soro as a distinguished leader in education. While thinking about what I would say this morning, I came across a quote from Jane Chu, Chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. Arts education fosters bright, creative, and socially engaged students who will grow up to be our next leaders, parents, teachers, artists, and engineers. Their innovative ideas will shape industries their creative thinking will find out-of-the-box solutions for a global society and will provide students with a way to understand themselves and to have a sense of belonging. Making and looking at art has been an integral part of my life since I was a little girl. It was my favorite way to share and express my feelings without having to be concerned with the exact words or other people's immediate reactions. After art school, I studied art therapy and creativity development that clarified for me how important the arts and creativity are 
for all people. Whether one is a direct participant or an involved observer, the arts bring deep and satisfying meaning to our lives. In today's world, this is especially imperative, even though most educational institutions treat it as icing on the cake. And as you all know, our federal government seems to agree. Although I seemingly teach eager students skills to draw, compose, paint, sculpt, and make pottery, and talk about their work, my primary goal is to enable them to learn to express themselves non-verbally. I have been privileged to teach art primarily to awkward middle school students. At the Dalton School, the arts are an integral part of every student's education. Dalton has a long history of an outstanding visual arts department, which I'm very proud to be part of. Studies have shown that making art develops a student's skills needed in problem solving, metacognition, developing self-confidence, and social skills. There is no right or wrong in art, which provides the artist, student, or professional the opportunity and ability to experiment and explore any ideas they want. And I am fortunate to share this unique opportunity with my students every day. Thank you for this wonderful honor for something that is a labor of love. I'm a very lucky person. Um, we have two young journalists who are getting awards now. And, um, and after that, we'll have the administrators and teachers come up to the front. So I want to call to the front the future of our nation and the future of writers and journalists, Haley Hershenson and William Friedman. Will the following people please come to the front? Carla Fuller, Lori Ongaman, they're both from Gutman Community College, Nicole Limperopoulos from Teachers College, Mark Erlen Wine, who's the principal of Staten Island Technical High School, Hal Fraser from the Robert Kennedy School, Nadja Graf, Turo College, P. David Kirkland from NYU, O'Hee Lee from NYU, and Ariel Cernis from the Sterling School of Brooklyn. We're going to take a group shot now of all of you holding your um, certificates up. Next group to come up will be Joan Toglia from Mercy College, Michael Gilliam, College of New Rochelle, Vivian Chen from the China Institute, Diana Rendon, Progress High School in Brooklyn, uh, Yusra Abdelhadi from Acorn Community High School in Brooklyn, Olivia Murphy, Bushwick Leaders High School in Brooklyn. Michaela Rafamante from the Lang School in Manhattan. Anna Kano Amato, PS 110 Brooklyn. Leander Eric Windley in Brooklyn, PS 318. Iwona Boris, special education teacher, PS 34 Brooklyn. Tony Herrera, Middle School 577 in Brooklyn. And Dr. E. Rose Pierre. She is the principal, School for Career Development in Brooklyn. And if you would please take your certificate and line up there so Andre can take your photograph, which will be placed online and in the next issue of Education Update, and of course, you'll all appear in YouTube. 
Thank you all for coming. Thank you.